Hi, everybody who can hear me. I'm just waiting for you to all get your audio ready and get everything set up. So we'll just give you a few minutes to come on in. Just taking a little while to get the tech sorted out today. So I'll just give you a few minutes to get that all, all sorted using a new platform, getting onto Zoom, a bit tricky. So I'll just give you a little while to do that. Great, so I can see people are managing to get on now. That's good stuff. Uh, if you do have any issues, then, well, if you do have any, any issues, you probably can't hear me. So that's a bit useless, isn't it? <laughs> to all those out there who aren't able to get on, if you've got any issues, give us a shout. We'll try and sort it out for you. Um, yeah, I can see people managing to get on now. So hi, if you are on, if you are managing to get on and you're just um, joining joining us today, then put your put your name in the chat, say hi. Uh, if you can put your name into all panel, all attendees, because I think sometimes we just get the chat directed towards the panelists. And that's not fair because you want to be able to talk to everybody. So make sure you're make sure you're broadcasting to the world when you say hi. Um, a bit of a, it's become a bit of a tradition now at this event to put your favorite storage joke in the chat. So if you have got any, I know you must have so many to choose from. There's amazing storage jokes. So if you've got one, stick it in the chat because we're, we ours are really bad <laughs> and we need to get some better storage jokes going. So please do. Give us some ideas. If it gets really bad, I have to ask our producer Rachel to tell her a joke, and no one wants that. So, cool. Oh, just give a few people a few more minutes before we get started. That's all right. Oh, so there'll be a few of you joining on Zoom, a few of you on Hoover. Uh, so, if, yep, both, we can see both of the both of the platforms there, so don't worry. Either one that you're joining on is absolutely fine. Uh, you can you can see us on both. Okay, we'll just give it another minute or so, and then we'll then we'll get started. Um, okay, seeing as you've uh, you know I've had so I've had now five requests to tell my favourite stories joke, so I should probably do that whilst we're here. Um, which one to choose? It's difficult. Okay, so I bought a jumper from the store the other day, and it was just full of static electricity. So I had to take it back and it was all right because they gave me a new one free of charge. Uh, they, they're all on mute and I can't, can't hear you all laughing heartily at my very, very funny joke. So I'm just going to assume that you did. I'd never be a stand-up comedian. I don't have the... I don't, oh, thank you, Sophie. Thanks, Sophie. I feel better now. <laughs> yeah, definitely can't be a stand-up comedian. Not my... I'll stick with storage. It's fine. <laughs> Okay, right. So hopefully, we should. You should all have managed to get your tech sorted out now, and everyone's joining. So I will make a start. Um, just in case you're in the wrong place, uh, this is the Electricity Storage Network Annual Marketplace. We're talking about the sustainability of supply chains. So if that's not what you're intending to hear today, then you should probably maybe leave or stay and stay in here, <laughs> here from here, here a new subject. So hopefully, you are all expecting that though, and you're in the right place. So this is day three of our annual marketplace event. It's the final day. So thanks for everyone who stuck with us throughout the whole three days. If this is the first event that you've joined today, then welcome. Um, this is the first and last event. So thanks for thanks for sparing the time to join us today. Um, so yeah, the, we're the Electricity Storage Network. If you haven't come across us before, we're the UK voice for electricity storage. And we're managed by Regen. So Regen are a renewable energy not-for-profit with a mission to decarbonize the energy system. So we're coming at, from, at that from a storage and a renewable angle as well. So this is our online annual event. So we're doing it online this year. We normally do it in person. We've been doing it for a good 10 years or, or, or more now with the ESN. Uh, so thanks for sticking with us as we try and things out online, do things in a new way. It's a bit of a new medium to interact with you all. So thanks very much for, for sticking with us with that. Um, I should say thanks to our sponsors this year for, for um, helping us put this on. So Fluence, Road Knight Taylor, Swan Barton, LCP and Schneider. Um, we're all trying to get used to running these things in the new world of, of having to do things from home. And without our sponsors, we definitely couldn't have put this event on this year. So thanks very much um, for, for sponsoring and thanks for supporting us during the event. 
So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. So some of you will be on Hoover, some of you will be on Zoom. If you're on Hoover, then have a look at the functionality, take a look around. Um, this is the last session of the day, but some of that functionality will be available going forward. So have a look at all the 600 participants, make sure you have a chat with them, look at the community uh, discussions and interact if you want to you know I'm sure you'd much rather be doing it over a glass of wine or a tiny sandwich but unfortunately we can't so in the meantime maybe just uh, engage with some of your uh, fellow participants online instead so if you're not in Hoover you've decided to join on zoom that's absolutely fine if that works better for you no problem you can ask questions in both so ask questions and use the chat doesn't matter where you put it, we'll see it somehow. <laughs> uh, we've got people furiously working away in the background to make sure it gets through to us. So don't worry, uh, wherever you put that question, we will get it. And I should say as well, we've got a full session of um, discussion today, Not, no presentations apart from me waffling on at you. So please do ask questions because there's a good opportunity here for you to, to speak to our panellists. So uh, getting on to today's session. So today we're discussing sustainability of mineral supply chains. So just to give you a bit of an intro to that and, and why we're talking about it today. Well, we all know how important storage is to net zero. We've had three days of sessions talking about just that. We know the role that it's going to play in helping us achieve net zero and a renewable system. And we know also know how much of a role batteries have to play in that as well. They're playing a big role right now, hence why we've been talking about them a lot for the last three days. And um, we know they'll have a role to play in the future. Um, and we're seeing, you know, we're hopefully looking at gigawatts of, of storage and probably gigawatts of batteries as well. So as we build up this particular industry to tackle one major problem, you know, the climate emergency, we really have to be careful that we're not creating another environmental and human rights problem elsewhere. So we have to make sure that we're not perpetuating the problems caused by many extractive industries in the past, you know, this isn't a new issue. Extractive industries are difficult to manage and we have seen lots of difficult issues in the past from different industries. So whilst we're at the start of this industry, let's make sure we're considering not perpetuating some of those problems as well. And it is something that the Electricity Storage Network has been discussing for some time now. We have a working group where we discuss this particular issue um, itself and we really want to start taking some of those discussions forward into action now so I'm hoping this session can give us an idea of what some of those actions might be to tackle this problem rather than just having endless discussions about very interesting very important discussions but we do need some action as well. And I should acknowledge as well that this we know this is an issue beyond the utility storage industry so electric vehicles portable any portable technology with a battery they're also a major part of the solution as well and absolutely we're not the first to encounter this problem with extractors as i've already said but we're not the first to encounter this problem with with the extractive uh, issues of lithium cobalt nickel all all minerals that are being used in other technologies as well so we need to learn from those industries and what they've learned already and we need to work with other, with other industries as well so we're talking about it today as the as the electricity storage network looking at sort of utility scale and uh, uh, batteries for power and for energy um, but we need to look beyond other industries too so i have three excellent speakers today to help me debate this subject we've got ashton carter who's the chief executive officer for TDI sustainability, who are really looking at this issue on the ground. Um, uh, Ashton's got a wealth of experience across the um, across the, the mining industry and the mineral and the extractors industry, but also working on the ground to actually take action um, to help um, improve conditions in mines across the world. We've got Patalina Rosso, who's the chair of our sustainability working group. And as I mentioned, um, we, we run the sustainability, safety and supply chain working group, which Catalina has been leading for the last year. Uh, and Catalina has really great experience of developers and, and how developers are addressing this issue. And also Tony Hartwell is the project lead from the uh, Farsi Institution, the Relib project, which I'm sure he'll tell you more about, is looking at more at, at how the chemical composition of the batteries we have, how we change and improve those, and how we recycle and reuse those, uh, those batteries as well. So before I do come to those speakers and give them a chance to jump in, uh, I just wanted to give you a bit of a starter for 10, a, a brief overview of where we might start addressing some of these issues across the whole life cycle of the battery. So Rachel, if you could just bring up the, the slide here. Um, so this is just a, a very rough idea of the life cycle of the, of the battery or the, um, 
the different points, pain points in the supply chain where we might start addressing these issues. So just to quickly take you through some of those. So looking at the start of that research and development phase, so that, 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 point, that point of development, so improving and changing battery chem chemistries here, considering other different technologies as well. Uh, so we, we, we are talking about batteries today, but the, one of the solutions here is to look beyond batteries to different types of technologies. And we were discussing some of those yesterday at our uh, technology and innovation session. Looking on the ground at the point of extraction, so you've decided you do need those minerals, how can you make sure that you're improving the conditions in mines um, for, for the, looking at both human rights issues, but also sustainability, environmental issues as well. Then looking within the supply chain, so once those minerals start moving around the supply chain, how do we make sure those are transparent? So when you're buying and selling particular minerals, how do we make sure we know the provenance of them and the sustainability of how they've been extracted? Then looking at investment, so how do we make sure the money that's, that's moving around here, that's, that's the, the, the investing in developing these projects, how do we make sure that is sustainable? Very much linked, of course, to the transparency of those supply chains. And then moving on to the end of life as well. So once we've finished using the product, how can we make sure that it's been built in a way that we can recycle it easily? And then we actually recycle those minerals as well and reuse them. So we're not just extracting tons of lithium and then throwing it away at the end. How can we reuse it? But also reuse and give a second life to the batteries as well. So we're not just um, taking it to half its life and then, and then throwing it away. We're actually making full use of the product. And then just in the middle there, throughout that whole process, this is probably one of the trickiest bits, but making sure we've got standards and laws in place to make sure all of these things happen properly. Uh, this is very much a global issue. You know, where do we get these standards from? How do we learn from standards and laws that already exist and maybe use those to, to dictate what happens in our industry, um, but also create new ones that might be suitable for, for the storage industry. So I'll stop there because I'll, I'll probably gone through a, a fair bit there, but hopefully that just gives you a bit of an intro into, into the, the conversations we've been having within our industry and what we'd like to get to today. So I'll go to the panel now. Um, so I'd like to, if the panel could just introduce themselves and give, give their interest in the subject. And I'd also like to ask the panel and, your, and the audience an introductory question here. So the, um, we do have a poll. Um, so if the audience could answer answer the poll as it comes up, but also the, the panel will be discussing this question as well. So um, is sustainability an issue that concerns or should concern the industry right now? Is it an issue for now or do we need to wait until the industry matures and we un understand this problem better? So um, Catalina, I'll come to you first. If you could just say, introduce yourself and your interest in this topic and also have a, uh, have a go at addressing that question initially. Uh, thank you, Madeleine. Thank you, Regen, Regen and everyone attending. It has been a, uh, have been attending various session. I found this very useful. So thank you for organizing. Very happy to be here. For those who I don't know, uh, my name is Catalina Guillen Rosso, and I'm here as the chair of the Electricity Storage Network Working Group, Sustainability, Safety, and Supply Chain. Uh, my role as a chair, the first thing we did was identify priorities and the four priorities we identified, the first one was fire safety, then we have uh, sustainability and supply chain, second life and recycle and CO2 life cycle emissions. So this is really relevant for the group. We have members from uh, manufacturers to contractors to operators, lawyers, uh, we have sometimes base and object also participating. So as you see, it's the broader is an industry-led um, initiative. And why is it important? So you have seen the debate in different industries that ESG, you have it in investment, you have it in every single industry, but for our industry is particu particularly important. And that's because that's what we do. We are an ESG company. So it's not something that's an option. That's what we do. We help communities to have clean air, we help the decarbonization of the energy sector, the decarbonization of the transport sector, and many other industries. And we are doing a positive impact on uh, our community. So we are an ESG company. We have a lot of pressure. The pressure comes from direction because um, CEOs have that vision of um, imp improving, improving in general um, the communities and the environment. We have that pressure from talent. We attract talent also because now um, employees want a purpose. We have pressure from our partners. We have pressure from uh, governments because obviously we don't want to be seen as, for example, 
uh, reducing CO2 here and polluting elsewhere. That, that doesn't make much sense. And we have a lot of pressure if we want to, to look for investment. You may know that if you have been uh, going to some raising fund process that your you will have a big scrutiny on ESG. So we have a lot of advantages because what we are doing, we have advantages from green finance, green recovery. We have investment interest, but we also can expect to have big scrutiny on ESG. And so I think, yeah, it's relevant. All our members have voted on this being a main issue and it is relevant and we need to address it now. Great, thanks, Catalina. Excellent points on investment as well. Hopefully we'll come back to some of that in the next part of the session. Um, Tony, if I can bring you in, if you could um, introduce yourself and also answer the, that same question. Hi, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk today. Um, I'm a metallurgical engineer that's been uh, around for a few years. Uh, and I've worked in the global supply chain for probably more than 30 years uh, in more than 25 countries, uh, including six years in Africa, in, in Ghana and Zimbabwe. I've worked at mines, smelters, refineries and recycling facilities. So really from that experience, I, I, over the, from the, for the last 15 years, I've been trying to see how we can work across different stakeholder groups to, to look at developing more sustainable uh, systems for managing materials. I think it's important to remember when, when we use fossil fuels, they are consumed, they are converted into gases uh, and, and obviously generate greenhouse gases. But when we use, uh, and, and the, uh, the point I'm trying to get here is there's a difference between things like metals and, and fossil fuels because you really do consume fossil fuels when you use them. But uh, with metals, there may be some wear, there may be some corrosion, but usually at the end of life, there's still material left. And it's important right from the very design stage to think about how we can manage those materials at end of life to get the optimum value and the, and the minimum impact on the, uh, across the whole life cycle. So my point would be that really we need to consider end of life management right from the very design stage. And, and, and that should include a team of people, including material scientists, into, including people that are, uh, are developing the product and, and to take that into consideration from the beginning. Now, where I'm working at the moment and how I came onto this discussion really is I work out of the University of Birmingham on a R&D project funded by the Faraday Institution. There is a consortium of universities. There's uh, Newcastle, Leicester, uh, Oxford Brooks, Cardiff, uh, and I'm trying to make sure I don't forget anybody, but uh, there's, uh, on the website, you'll see all the universities involved. And a uh, role really was several years ago when they, the UK decided it was going to decarbonize and move towards uh, electric vehicles. It realized that obviously development of batteries was important. Uh, the UK is a major exporter of uh, combustion engines. So uh, if we're going to transition to electric vehicles, then we needed to uh, have the technology and the knowledge in the battery sector. Our particular project is focusing on how to manage uh, the batteries at the end of life in the electric vehicle. And uh, in some of the later questions, I'll come on and describe a little bit more about the batteries themselves. But, but on in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, I think I would have to give a politician's answer to that question because I think it was an issue yesterday, it's an issue today, and it will be an issue in the future as well. Good answer, good politician's answer, but yeah, very good point as well. And we'll definitely come back to some of those points later, Tony, on, on, um, on the chemical composition and, and the circular economy as well. Um, great, so thanks, Tony. Ashton, can I bring you in for, for your final introduction? Yes, thanks very much. So I'm, I'm Ashton Stuart Cart. I'm CA, CEO of TDI, uh, well, of two organizations actually. Um, TDI is a specialist consultancy. We work mostly on um, mineral supply chains, but also other commodity supply chains. And we work um, right up at the mine, um, right down to the appliance OEMs and battery manufacturers as well. So we work in about 15 different countries. Um, and really kind of looking both at um, both at risk and also how do you um, contribute to sustainable development as well. Um, and a big part of that, and as mentioned just earlier, um, is working on standards. So we're currently working on standards in the cobalt industry, the nickel industry, the zinc, copper, uh, lithium, um, 
industries as well. And so we develop a lot of these standards that are used up and down the supply chains um, to do due diligence and also to regulate operating practices at mine sites. Um, out of that, um, working on kind of risks and sustainability in the supply chain, and really going back to when I did my PhD in the mid 90s on kind of mining, um, it, you know, what I realized, well, I went in to do my PhD on mining because I thought, look, if there's, if, if we can crack the, the negatives associated with mining, then everything is downhill from there. Um, but of course, what I found out was that the, um, the mining is an incredible contributor to sustainable development in some of the poorest parts of the world, if only we can harness that. Um, but it's very often they're kind of neglected. You know, mining is actually the second biggest employer in Africa after agriculture. Um, but it is tarnished um, with a, a, a brush that kind of puts it into the negative side of a ledger. So I started something as well called the Impact Facility for Sustainable Mining Communities, and that's a nonprofit, and we facilitate um, impact investment into mining communities upstream in places like the Congo, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and Ghana. Um, and I think this is really, um, we can talk a little about that later, I think, in some of the questions that come up, but how should we be looking at mineral supply chains and um, looking at ways of how we can transition that to more sustainable supply chains? Should this industry be concerned about sustainability? Well, I think we should all be concerned about sustainability. And I thought it was put very well there. You know, many of these problems that we're talking about now in the halls of um, Westminster, um, you know, I'm sure that Tony and I were talking about them 25 years ago <laughs> um, in, in universities. Um, it's, you know, when are we going to wake up and when is it going to be fast enough? From purely sort of corporate um, sustainability point of view, um, there's definitely an acceleration of interest and expectations increasing on what companies should do. It is no longer enough um, for companies to say, well, I'm avoiding the negatives in my supply chain or other aspects of your business. The expectations, poll after poll will show that the expectations are that companies should be showing, demonstrating how they're making a, um, a positive impact. So I think the question maybe for the panel today is not whether, but it's kind of how can we get involved when we're so far away from the end of a supply chain where the concerns are most strongly held and um, what should we do about it and how can we collectively do something about it? Absolutely, yeah, I completely agree. Thanks, Ashton. Um, if we could just bring up the results of the poll and just see what people were thinking. Oh, that, look at that, fantastic. <laughs> That's what I wanted to see. I was a bit concerned that we might not get that answer, but yeah, I think that, that definitely puts us on a good footing for the rest of the conversation today. Um, if we could just bring all the panellists into, uh, into view and then we'll start the discussion. And I think Ashton, I'll just take you were the last person to speak and I think it's a, a good place to start um, with your experience. Could you just talk us through some of the key concerns that are throughout the mineral supply chain? I think it's often, you see all these um, articles coming out, the dirty secret of the EV industry and things like that. It's not really a secret, is it? These, these issues, we know that we, there are several issues throughout the supply chain, um, but sometimes maybe these are either overblown or we focus too much on one particular issue. I just wonder where you see some of the key problems within the supply chain that we need to address. Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. I was looking at that question. I'd be, maybe it's a bit controversial rather than just going to what are the issues. I'll go to the question itself. And I'm just wondering if we're asking the right, the right question. To me, the right question um, might be, how do we ensure that our supply chains, more mineral supply chains, deliver more for sustainable de de development? Um, and the reason why I say that, because it will it'll urge us to engage in the supply chains rather than try to avoid the supply chains. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of reasons why I think that's a compelling argument. First is that, um, you know, I'm sure we all are, especially on this um, call, uh, proponents of the circular economy and how we can electrify and digitalize and have a low carbon economy. But to do that and have a circular economy, you need to have stock to have stock, you need to have materials. And those materials are still going to be needed for the next uh, 20 or 30 years, and maybe even beyond that, even with Cobalt, um, you know, we work with companies like Tesla as well. And, you know, they still say that they're going to need three to 4% of cobalt in their batteries just for its longevity. So the chemical composition technology might change a bit, but these raw materials are, are important. So can we even avoid it? Um, and if we can't, the imperative then is to see how can we, um, how can we improve it um, on the ground and make it sustainable. 
and there's a couple of things there as well. One is that um, there's a there's a there's a tendency to generalize about mineral supply chains that they are all bad. Extractive industries are all bad because they generate waste. Waste always gets dumped and pollutes rivers. Um, that is not 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 the case. There's a distinction to be made between responsible mining uh, of all sizes, whether that's big or small. So I think one of the first questions should be, how do we actually distinguish between supply chains that are responsible and those that are kind of falling um, short of our falling short of our expectations? Mm -hmm. In the particular, the minerals that um, the battery industry uses, you know, if you look at um, copper, um, you look at nickel, these are large scale mines. Um, uh, which uh, generally have foreign investors. So the levers to pull, um, some of which you had on your board earlier, like the investors and the supply chains, these can influence those supply chains very much. Um, for things like kind of cobalt, which is concentrating the DRC, this should of course be a concern because of the concentration in the DRC, 70%, 80% of cobalt comes from there. But again, in my mind, more of a imperative to see what can be done to engage and clean up the, um, the instances where cobalt has been mined um, in a suboptimal way. And that's why we're working there in the Congo on um, cobalt standards. Mm. One thing I'll just kind of leave you with is um, on this part of the conversation anyway, is you know, we're also working on a deep sea mining project as well with the World Economic Forum. Um, and this opens up a whole new area of um, concern where most of the uh, risks associated with minerals are to do with human rights and conflict um, with the deep sea. This is to do with environmental biodiversity in a whole new area, a wilderness area, if you want, that has been um, unexplored. But these minerals, nickel, zinc, cobalt, manganese, will be in supply chains um, if the trajectory is followed within the next seven years. So being able to ask the right questions and get informed about these things, I think, is where all um, companies in your network could certainly start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a bit. That's a good challenge, Ashton. I think you. I think you're right. I think we need to make sure we're focusing. And I would like this this panel session to get to the point where we're focusing on on action and as well. So, um, Catalina, did you want to come in on that? Yes, thank you, Madeline. Um, my first point will be to clarify. Also, um, there there has been a lot of um, that there has been a lot of bad press on mining, and we are conscious that. There are issues and that's what we're trying to solve. But also I want to highlight that, for example, not all batteries have cobalt. Um, the majority of, for example, standalone, or if you want like big battery storage sites, they do not have, a, we, don't, we don't use cobalt. Now on that issue, I want to say also think about what is the best solution. That's a debate. Some suppliers will go and say, okay, because there are some issues in cobalt, we do not contract with, um, with, with manufacturers that use cobalt. Is that is a solution, but also it can create a problem because um, these the li livelihoods of people will depend on the mineral. So is the problem is now, as I say, we cannot stop realistically, um, is forecast and forecast that to achieve global environmental targets, we need to increase the, minerals, we need to keep graphite, lithium and cobalt for 450%. So it's how we do it. We can do it in a way that is very bad. And we have seen examples with coal when there is corruption, they, they don't respect natural resources or can do it in a way that the countries uh, we respect, for example, in Bolivia, where we expect to have a lot of lithium extraction, we can work with local communities when we are respectful of indigenous communities, well, we respect the water, we don't uh, is, but water is not polluted, uh, and also that the country and the communities benefit from the economic growth. So it, it can have a positive impact if it's managed correctly. So that's mm -hmm. a point. And another point is also think that storage is working currently in other technologies that will help spread that not everything will have to be batteries. With the UK, for example, if you have seen the 10 point plan is where in supporting the liquid air technology and we're working out of stops of storage to um, not put more pressure on the supply chain. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Catalina. I just come back to one of your points you made there about, um, you know, not, not, you know, co cobalt, we could cut it out or we could say that, that we could just 
hammer the mining industry and say they're really bad. And I do see quite a lot of people in the environmental sector just saying, we shouldn't be extracting, that's really bad. They do it really badly. Well, that's obviously not a solution. We, we have to extract minerals. Um, I've seen some people saying, yeah, let's just cut up cobalt completely. But the impact of that on these communities is, is severe. If we just say we, you know, want to, as, a, as a massive um, part of that industry, if we just say, well, we don't, we don't want that anymore. We're not going to take your, take your, um, your minerals. You know, that's a huge impact on their, uh, on, on a massive income for their countries and for, the, and for their communities. So I, I wonder if, Tony, perhaps I can address this to you. Um, when we talk about uh, addressing issues with particular companies, with particular minerals, with particular countries who are producing these minerals, um, at what point do we say, okay, well, we just blacklist you and we don't want to use you anymore, or do you know, or, or work with them to make things better? What there's a, there's a difficult balance there. You know, we can't just cut people off, but also if we see bad practice, we need to do something about that. And I wonder, there's, I wonder if you have a, an opinion on on how we go about, you know, that sort of slightly nuanced approach to to people who aren't performing quite as well as we want them to. Yeah, sure. I just would like to follow up a little bit on what Ashton said is, um, I think we're all a little bit in denial. Like if we live in the developed world, we are all miners really, uh, because um, nobody produces copper or cobalt if there isn't a demand for it. So the, the miners are, are satisfying a demand. So, you know, we could uh, reduce mining by reducing our demand for those materials. So. So really, we are all miners, and it's just a question whether we take the responsibility for that. Mm. Do we are we prepared to pay more for a more responsible mining operations and, and the high, things that would maybe involve a higher cost? That's another question. I think uh, you know sometimes uh, in Australia they've said well, you know we can supply some of the minerals that are uh, produced in other countries that uh, have a, a lower standard, but it's more expensive. Uh, are you is a company prepared to pay? 10% more for a, a product that is, is more responsibly produced. I think that's a question that we have to ask uh, mm. uh, to ourselves and, and, and to the industry. So, uh, so yeah, I, and there's another important point is uh, you know, it, the, one of the mines that I worked on uh, in Ghana was, it started in 1925 and uh, it was a, a whole community developed around that mine uh, that's provided employment for all that uh, period of years. Initially, they they produced manganese uh, oxide, which was used in in zinc batteries, and and the mine was coming towards the end of its life. Uh, and and when I was working there, and we would try to find alternates, it now produces manganese carbonate, which is a very important uh, mineral for the manganese that's used in batteries because uh, it's acid soluble, and you don't actually use it. You don't need metallic manganese for the manganese used in batteries. You use use a, it's a, it's a carbonate that you use or a hydroxide. So, so there are specific places, as, as Ashton said, the uh, cobalt. If you want to use cobalt, the biggest source is is is, uh, is uh, the DRC, and uh, it's not only environmental practices. There's been some sharp uh, financial practices. Uh, there's recent press about the. Steinmetz uh, operations in uh, in DRC and, and and Danny Gertler's operations in DRC. So, it, it isn't just a question of uh, of uh, you know uh, poor mining practices. It's uh, sometimes the bribery and corruption that goes on uh, mm -hmm. in those countries as well. And uh, we all have to uh, take a role in that. Mm. Uh, Ashton, I'm sure you have plenty of experience of that. Is, is, do you want to come in and respond? I mean, just picking up on kind of one point that Tony made about the kind of the the, the, the green premium or the sustainability premium, and I, I, I mean, I, I also um, own a ethical jewellery brand as well, where you thought that you'd be able to get a premium for um, people wanting to adorn themselves with something which aligns with their values, but I can tell you for the last ten years more, the green premium is pretty much dead. Um, so you know, we don't want to pay the cost of internalising externalities. At the moment, um, you know, I think we've become too used to having cheap commodities transported around the world um, to do that. Um, so it's very difficult to make that um, to make that argument or to expect that. And you know, as I said, we work with a lot of very big companies, and um, for sure, the laudable sentiments in terms of sustainable 
ability, but then there's a commercial reality as well, especially when you've been going through a year like we have. So what we've got to try and do is find a way to um, develop um, resources, which is responsible um, and that um, those practices are baked into um, normal operating procedure, not seen as a not seen as a nice to have. Mm. In, in, ter in terms of your countries, I mean, one of your things is saying was learn from lessons of the past. I mean, I first started working in the DRC about 10 years ago, and it was around kind of the conflict minerals. And that time it was kind of tin and tungsten tantalum, which were the key things. And the um, electronics industry at that stage decided that the best thing to do, because Africa was a long way away from Seattle um, and other parts of the US, was best to avoid it. So everything that um, they had leveled accusations that the industry were going wrong, they only exacerbated. Because some of these small miners, or most all these small miners in these countries, they work day to day. So they don't have checking accounts, they don't have credit lines, they get paid that day for a day's work. So as soon as they stopped buying the cobalt, they down tools, and then they started moving across the country into the national parks um, and you know, taking whatever resources they could just to survive, and then moved up to the gold fields in the north of the country. So, you know, there's trade-offs, there's always a trade-off. Um, and we've got to consider those trade-offs and the responsible thing to do is to try and reduce the impacts of that trade-off. And that's why I think that absolutely we need to promote the circular economy, recycling, design appropriately. But at the same time, we need to sort of look to see how we can um, enable and support responsible natural resource um, production at the same time. And it's difficult to do because you don't always have a aligned to the president of that country. <laughs> um, so working with both influential um, companies as well as um, small players along the supply chain, um, gradually, I think, is what we can all um, try and do and group together, you know, the collective, <laughs> the power of the collective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just on that point about so learning from other industries, you've given some good examples there, Ashton. Tony, I mean, obviously Faraday works in the EV industry um, quite a lot, um, uh, and you've got plenty of experience of working with other other parts of the mining industry as well. Do you have any experience you could share of where we could learn from other industries beyond what Ashton's just said? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> look, I don't, I don't think it's just the mining sector. Uh, Rolls Royce, for example, uh, they, they don't sell aircraft engines, they sell uh, power by the hour. So. So they sell a, a, an engine and they, when they take it back at the end of its life, they refurbish the components that they can and reuse a, a lot. Um, the turbine blades, a lot of them attain, contain cobalt and nickel. Uh, it's very important for them to, to retain ownership of those materials. Uh, so they either have uh, subsidiaries or, or, or companies that they work with that keep that material in a, in a, in a loop, if you like. Mm -hmm. Uh, I agree, Ash. I mean, you're recycling, you know, sometimes uh, I think us in the West, we, we sort of put recycling as the panacea for everything. Uh, when you have a growth industry, it's very difficult to, to meet every requirement through recycling. So, so I think, it, and, and recycling isn't always the most uh, uh, sustainable way of producing something. Some, if, if the material is complex, it may be uh, more energy or more environmentally friendly to produce it from a primary material anyway. But so I, I don't think there should be a conflict between the primary and the secondary. I think it, it's a question of optimizing the both parts of that supply chain to get the best overall environmental picture. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's not just within the, I'd say the mining, often, often the mining sector one of the companies that was voted to be one of the greenest companies in the world uh, is a company called Umicore in Belgium. It mm. used to get a lot of its materials from DRC, uh, especially when uh, when it was owned by the uh, the king of Belgium. Uh, but uh, it, it's gone away from primary materials now, and it processes all, only secondary materials. But it's a it's a major producer of, uh, of of nickel cobalt from these covered materials, and it's one of the few places in Europe that has a, a system for recycling uh, a large battery systems uh, at the moment. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, the companies can, okay. can contribute uh, across the, that spectrum. Mm. 
Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, uh, Ashton and Kathleen, I can see you both have your hands up. Uh, I would like to move in the last 20 minutes to sort of focus on solutions and um, some of the things we can be doing. I know we've already started that conversation. So Ashton, I don't know if you want to comment on, on what Tony was saying, and but if you can start to move towards talking about some of the solutions and things we can do, that'd be great. Well, just something which I kind of picked up on um, that will kind of jog my, jog my memory um, about um, Rolls-Royce isn't really selling engines, it's basically selling a service. And so in the mining industry, um, there has actually been conversations recently, um, perhaps rather forward-looking, about mining as a service. Um, and because one of the things I see, um, especially sitting where many of your members are sitting, is that there's a disconnect um, between the downstream and the upstream. And um, there isn't a way to communicate. And that's why we have things like standards um, and the mining industry certainly feels like it's the most unloved industry in the world. So the mining as a service is basically saying what we're going to do is not just be the miners, but we'll also be the recyclers and we'll, we'll be part of, that, part of that loop. And I think what that will enable us to do is to, um, is to uh, build better communications along the supply chain. Yeah, I love that your dogs are just as passionate about this as you, Ashton. That's great. <laughs> yes, they're all supply chain experts. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kathleen, uh, if you want to comment on anything Tony and Ashton have said, but also I, I wonder, you mentioned at the start that you talked about ESG and, and investment. I wonder if you could touch on that as part of the solution to this problem as well and what we should be doing on the investment side of things. That's perfect. Thank you, Madeline. So first, your, I think I want to come back on your question, how can we learn from other industries? Mm -hmm. And I agree that the EV manufacturer, we have a lot to learn because first they have more experience than us uh, managing complex supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, they have more resources and the bigger companies. And one of the challenges for us has been transparency and traceability. One of the challenges is and, and as you imagine, most of the companies of our members, uh, they are relatively new companies or startups with limited resources. So one of the problems is the due diligence. And in this industry, we have identify also, we have something that's called bottlenecks, where we have little competition, also is a focus on certain regions. Um, and it's difficult to have visibility. So more exactly, obviously, is mining, but it's also refining um, the cattle manufacturer, the cell manufacturer. And until now, it has been assumed is mightily in our recycling. So to have more uh, to, to come to the solutions, we have some think about some solutions. One is traceability for that there's a project to do and it's a little bit of early stage, but it will be good to have some blockchain. Why blockchain? Because this way we, we can know exactly where the minerals come from. If you, if it's very difficult to hack or lie when you ha when you can trace the, um, the minerals via a blockchain, because it's very secure. Um, so we, we could have a better um, visibility. And the problem is, Obviously, obviously, all the participants in Europe and the UK, I imagine the US, we align with standards. We do have standards and we apply policies to the supply chains. Uh, but how we do the due diligence is a little bit, mm -hmm. um, we, we cannot send someone to all the supply chain that I just mentioned, given the resources and the proximity and also. So that's, that's one thing is stressability. I think oh, there will be a more comprehensive uh, coming together, being more coherent and how we all, um, we all measure and our standards. There's a lot of standards that are a little bit uh, comprehensive, but there's not really a one, um, a one single policy for storage and that we can follow and compare between companies. I think also we come together, we can put more pressure on supply chain other mm -hmm. solution has been, uh, and we have seen some actors that are cutting the middleman. That means that they're doing contract directly with the miner. They have more control. And if they don't have more control, some companies have take some stakes on the companies to have more input on the policies on how it's governed. So there are some, um, some solutions. And if you think now about the recycling and second life, um, maybe I will let the other panelists also give their opinion on that. But one of the solutions will be also speaking with the manufacturers for them to actively make it easier for 
the reuse of the disassembling the reuse and second life. And we think there's an opportunity for the UK. Some companies are doing very good things on second life and recycling. We could start doing this locally and control the way this is done is done and avoid the transportation and also there are very uh, there are some of our members that are, are utilizing some software to improve the life of the battery so you can cycle the battery using in a some way that will extend the life of the battery so there here are some of the solutions that uh, the, the industry is thinking of implementing mm. Well, thanks, Castellina. Ashton, uh, if you could, if you look like you want to respond to that, but also if you could just address uh, from your experience, I know that's something that TDI and the Impact Facility and the Fair Cobalt Alliance are all looking at um, in terms of traceability and how we understand what's happening down the supply chains. If you have any opinions on that, I'd like to hear them as well, if possible. Yeah, so, so I'll definitely do that. Um, so on the due diligence and practical solutions, so I guess a little announcement. Um, Two years ago, we came out with a publication called Material Change. Uh, Material Change looked at 40 different um, minerals um, and analyzed those and in a very kind of pragmatic way, try to put up a, um, a heat map on where the different risks were to enable prioritization. So at the start of the due diligence. So in June this year, all going well, we'll launch the online version of that. And that'll be much more interactive and it'll look at about 60 different um, materials and mostly minerals, but also other other materials as well and that'll break down the supply chain it'll, it'll, it'll do uh, an allegations analysis it'll look at particular companies which are bigger companies it'll also look at all these standards because we also do a lot of work on standards so it'll have a, a way to compare different standards and where they apply um, and um, a, a kind of a codex if you want for trying to understand it so that and that'll all be free <laughs> that's the good thing about that is the whole idea is to democratize sustainability and supply chain management. So yeah, please do keep in touch on, on that particular on that particular thing. Mm. On Ashton, the, just on, before you carry on, if you if some if you or one of your colleagues is able to put a link to that in the chat, I think that'd be great. Because I think there's quite a lot of people. I know it's not available yet, but where it will be on your website so people can see who you are and what you're doing, because I think that would be a very a, an amazing resource for people. Um, so if you're able to put that in the chat, that'd be I point. will do that. Yeah, I'll definitely do that um, once I finish talking, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. No, I won't ask you to do both at the same time. That's a bit harsh. <laughs> on, the, um, on, the, uh, on, on, on the traceability thing, yeah, we do, we do um, quite a lot of traceability in a very kind of pragmatic way. The most, and, and for sure, I mean, so, you know, blockchain is a, a way to ensure that information isn't corrupted. But like any system, it's information in, information out. So you have to have that information going in. You've got to trust that information in the first place. That means someone on the ground somewhere has got to put in the right information. Otherwise, you've just got very secure and correct information. The biggest challenge where, and there are some examples of blockchain and cobalt, um, but they mostly go from the big mines down to the big companies. So those supply chains are pretty well known anyway, so they don't represent the risk. So it kind of proves the point. Um, but the, the real kind of question challenge for us all is how can you use technologies like blockchain for where the risk um, really is on the ground. And the second most difficult thing is what's the business case? Because at the, most, at the moment, the, 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 the business model is that the downstream users have to pay for it. But if the, down, so the upstream users have to pay for it, so the mines have to pay for it. If the mines have to pay for it, there has to be a good reason. And at the moment, they, they can sell their materials, so there's not really an incentive. So the, the, the technology is there for sure. And at some point it's going to transform great parts of our economy. Um, but the struggle at the moment is um, how do you make the case for it and, and who pays and how can you take mm. advantage of it? And I think the only way to do this, like we're doing with material insights, is to form collectives because I don't think it's possible um, for you know, one or two companies to pay for all of this or, or a government to pay for it or they won't, um, and nor do I think it's appropriate that this sort of information, which is hopefully for improvements across our whole global economy, should be a commercial instrument mm. only, it should pay for itself, but hopefully we can democratise it a bit more. Yeah, yeah, and coming back to your point about that you made earlier about the green costs just not being taken up, and if it, it does have to be paid for somewhere, and if if that, green, if that green cost is not enough or it's just not being taken up by the very end consumer, then that, that needs to be levied somewhere else. These things, it costs money to extract things in the right way and it costs things, it costs money to make sure that people are doing it in the right way. None of this is 
free. Uh, anyway, yeah. I think it will work because due diligence, of course, isn't a value generator. It's a it's a cost mostly. Mm -hmm. So you need some sort of market signal. And if that's about access to markets, then that's an incentive in itself that you have to demonstrate that you've done due diligence. And that's certainly beginning to happen um, mm -hmm. and will only accelerate with the EU bringing in its regulations this year on um, due diligence or yeah. being posed this year, I should say, for, across all commodities. Yeah. Um, I would like to come back to that point on the EU. Tony, did you want, did you, were you just waving to come in on that point? Yeah, look, uh, on, on solutions really, and I, I've, as Catalina mentioned, obviously reuse should be the first consideration. And, uh, you know, when the, when the battery comes to the end of its useful life in an electric vehicle, it has 70% of state of health remaining. So, so there are companies looking at that. Of course, there's some then question about uh, who is responsible for that battery and how it's used mm -hmm. and if there's a problem with that battery so regulation and standardization on on how those batteries are tested and evaluated and authorized for a second life i think the other thing we have to try and remember too is that the batteries are not single items they are a collection of cells if that's a nissan leaf it's 192 leaf cells and if it's a tesla it's thousands of uh, cylindrical cells and each of those cells is made up of multiple components. In a, in a pouch cell, you have 40 uh, electrodes in there. So, and they're on tiny leaf, uh, thin leaf metal foils. So, you know, it, you couldn't really design something that was more difficult to recycle if you tried uh, in, in terms of end of life management. Uh, the focus up till now in battery production has been performance, cost, uh, life, uh, and really, there has been very little attention put to end of life. I think as time is going on, people are moving more towards battery packs that are more easily assembled, more easily disassembled. But that ne certainly needs to happen. One, one of the questions that's come up is, you know, is there an alternate to lithium? Well, actually, although they're called lithium ion batteries, there's about for a battery pack, there's about 1% lithium in there. So, you know, it's not though there's a lot of lithium in there, it's the current carrier in the cells. In the cells themselves, as part of the battery pack, there's probably maybe nearly 2% is lithium. But in the battery packs themselves, again, nickel and, and, and cobalt were about 3% each. Uh, there, because of the cost of cobalt, people are moving to lower and lower cobalt contents. But, and then there's a question of a safety element. People are looking at using sodium instead of lithium, uh, and they're looking at all sorts. So there, there isn't a battery chemistry. And I think as Catalina pointed out, some batteries use lithium iron phosphate uh, uh, chemistry. So there's no cobalt and no nickel in there. So, so for a, a recycler, he's got to think, how do I handle all these different chemistries? And how do I design a recycling plant that will manage all those different components? We don't have a plant in the UK at the moment. There are people looking at doing that. Uh, our project is trying to see how can we recover the materials at their highest value. So rather than trying to take them back to the metal or the mineral that they started from, can we recover them in a form that they can be reused in the battery system? And uh, I think that's where most places where they have a, a gigafactory, these large scale battery production units, uh, even Elon Musk is talking about developing his own recycling facility to go with his factories. So, so there's some question in the UK saying, well, this, we don't have a huge volume to recycle at the moment, so maybe it's, we don't need to do it yet. But my answer would be, yes, we do, because we need to develop the technology and we need to develop the processes to do it and, and optimise those. So mm -hmm. we shouldn't wait till the volume is there. We need to start doing it now so that we can develop that and have it ready for when the volumes are larger. Mm. And sorry, Ashton, just before I bring you in on that, just a follow up question to that, Tony. Um, it's probably a big question, so maybe you won't have time to answer it right now. But you, you talk about building up the, 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 the demand and the case for, for recycling. But the, the, a lot of people's response to that is there isn't a market right now, especially not in the UK, a little bit more in Europe, particularly towards the Far East as well, there's definitely more of a market, but at the moment there is no, there's no economic case for people to be recycling. There's no money involved and um, it's, it's the cost benefits are just not there. Do you see what you've just, what you've just been saying, trying to build up that economic case? Do you think that will work? Well, I think, I think it has to go beyond economics because uh, first of all, 
it's not really very safe to ship these batteries abroad. Mm. And, you know, there have been incidents where there's been fires when containers of, of uh, lithium ion batteries are shipped uh, abroad, even relatively small ones. And a lot of the fires that happen in recycling facilities are associated with lithium ion batteries. So, mm. so there's, and you know, if we're going to talk about a circular economy in the UK, maybe we should think about having a tighter circular economy and not semi-processing our materials here and then shipping them somewhere else where they're out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Maybe we're shipping them to a country where it handles them properly, but maybe they don't. So, yeah. so should we take more responsibility for that? And yes, it may not be economic to do it at the moment, but if, if we're investing in the future of a low carbon economy, maybe we need to set up that facility to, to have it developed and ready for when there is a market yeah. to, to make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Ashton, do you want to come in? Um, a, li a little bit on that, I, 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 um, and also on a question I just noticed in the Q&A from Anthony Price. Um, but just quickly on what Tony said, I, I, I can't agree more. This is, if we leave this up to the market, it's never going to happen. And if we um, look at all the big um, breakthroughs, technological breakthroughs, which is going to create a new paradigm, they've all taken about 50 years and they've all been backed by um, governments for probably that length of time as well. So it, it's about, it, this is as much about policy as it is about um, the economic case. So going to Anthony Price's question, just to, you know, we're also, you know, and I think this goes to my point about there's always a trade-off in this, in, in, in this game and it's about being honest about what those trade-offs are and being making decisions with your eyes wide open. And, you know, we're also working with the lead battery in, industry. I hope they're not your kind of um, enemies or opponents or something. But, you know, if you look at their environmental business case, 98, 99% um, recycled, not just recyclable. <laughs> um, and if you look at their life cycle analysis, looking at GHGs, considerably lower than um, lithium, -ion ba lithium ion batteries. But they got a bad reputation um, because of blood level, um, lead blood in the recycling part of the, of the supply chain taking part in mostly less developed um, countries. And so what we're trying to do there is like, how do we raise the standard of, of recycling, not of the mining and the primary production. And if you look at copper and you look at um, steel as well, it's the scrap, which is counts of 30 to 40%, where the kind of reputation issues lie. So I think there's you know, we talk about um, recycling as though it's the, you know, the, the, the chimera, the ultimate goal, and it absolutely is, but there's still a bit of work to do to convince that those um, trolls are in place to make that a responsible industry as well, not for this um, supply chain particularly, but um, generally across many. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Ashton. Thanks, Anthony, for that question as well. Anthony's definitely one of our supporters on this issue and always raising some good points. So thanks, Anthony. Um, right, we have a few minutes left, so very quickly, and I mean very quickly, um, I asked you a really hard question to answer in 30 seconds. <laughs> if there's one, one thing that you think people should take away from today, or one thing you think the industry should be doing next on this, um, where would you say we should go? You can keep that as high level and as easy as you like, or you can challenge us to do something very difficult. Um, Catalina, did you want to go first? Yeah, I think this is very general, but as mentioned before, ESG is something that evolves, it's not something that we're going to do today and stop doing, uh, you never stop doing ESG, it's, um, you, it's embedded in your policies. I think we can have a better consortium, I, I think also we need this problem, maybe needs um, government um, government and international um, help, because I don't think we, we, to raise standards and labels and that everybody's in a level playing field where everybody's obliged to commit to certain standards, I think is the only way to solve the economic problem that I get it cheaper, but I don't pay the cost. So maybe we need to have some standards. Also, I think there is uh, great capabilities here to produce um, um, better asset management of the battery life. Like we, we have uh, some members, as I say, have very good uh, developed and um, some very good software, sorry. Uh, second life, second life and recycle could also be an opportunity in the UK. Um, and that, that would be my, my point, I think. Great, thanks, Catalina. Hopefully we can take some of that forward as part of the working group as well. <laughs> uh, Tony, do you have a, any final thoughts on that? Oh, you're on mute, Tony. Yeah, I think it would be a follow-up to the previous thing. I, I, I really think we do need to lobby for this uh, development of a, a battery recycling facility in the UK. 
you know, not only the lithium ion batteries, but we, we've exported all the batteries for the last 20 years, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's a critical one, I think, uh, because without that capability, then I think we, we will struggle to manage the end of life uh, batteries that we generate. The other point that I would just like to sort of follow up with Ashton probably afterwards offline, but uh, in another another world, another project I worked on was with the uh, satellite uh, catapult and Earth observation is quite a good way of monitoring mining activities, especially mm -hmm. illegal mining and, uh, and artisanal mining. So uh, I will talk to Ashton offline about uh, use of Earth observation on mining activities. Right. Thanks, Tony. Ashton, very quickly, last point from you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a point. We were actually looking at satellites, looking to see how you can monitor changes in tailings um, impoundments to identify illegal mining. Um, I think I'll get back to my kind of first point is that um, it's really about, um, and it seems to me like you have the platform with Catalina leading the, um, the group there, but it, it's, it's for the supply chain, it's turning the, the question around. It's not how do we eliminate risk from the system, but how can we um, use our, um, our influence and our voice to um, identify ways for that supply chain to contribute to sustainable development along the supply chain and especially at the top end where it matters the most. I think by looking through that lens, you'll both be able to manage your risk um, as well as to demonstrate that the industry is a positive contributor. Excellent, great, good action for us to take forward there. Thanks Ashton. Um, we had just on time, so I will just wrap up. Um, thanks, that was a really, really fascinating hour. I could continue these discussions for a long time to come and I'm sure we will. And as you said, Catalina and I will be taking some of this forward within um, the sustainability working group and beyond within our membership. So if you wanna be part of that conversation with us, help us to solve this issue, help us to take some action, then please do become a member. We just a bit of a, a slide on screen there about uh, some, some of the existing members and, the, and costs and things like that. You can find all of that on our website. So do get in touch if you'd like to help us I'd like to be part of that conversation and I realized that this is the last I have the last voice on the of our whole marketplace event for three days so lucky me I get to round up everyone and say goodbye to everyone for the three days so thanks everyone for thanks to the speakers today and thanks to the speakers for the for the whole three days and thanks to everyone who's been attending for the three days as well we've we've had things from you know we've, we've heard some real challenge from our leaders or from Kathy McClay and um, from, from Marek at Fluence on, on Tuesday, we talked about the dynamic containment, you know, the new stacking in the, um, in the frequency response services. We looked deep into the control room and understood how we can actually uh, make decisions on, on, on energy balancing from day to day. Um, and this morning, we even looked, we looked beyond kind of to net zero and what just, how do we value and uh, storage and flexibility in a net zero world. So we've really gone from, uh, for, from a broad range of topics. And then today, obviously talking about a really different topic on sustainability. So huge range of subjects. I've taken loads away from these three days and I hope you have too. Uh, you can see all of this stuff online. So pass it on to anyone who you think might be interested. If you want to watch it again, then you can. Um, and we'll be following up with some, uh, with some content afterwards as well for you to, to look through in a bit of a summary of the event. So yeah, with, I will leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks to the speakers and thanks to everyone for attending. Have a nice afternoon.